we can do it. <clears throat> but before we take over the world, we will go to Vrindavan by sound vibration. And uh, I don't have my keyboard here because it takes up so much room. And I left my cartels and uh, Redunga in the house. So we're doing a cappella lately. Is that okay, Sydney? A cappella, you can really, if you're not a good singer and you do a cappella, everything is revealed. <laughs> Jeradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Kupi Janabalaba Giri Bharadhari Kupi Janabalaba Giri Bharadhari Jiso Dhananana Raja Janaranjana Jiso Dhanandana Raja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Marhava Kunjabi Hari Jashodhanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jashodhanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jai Radha Marhava Kunjabi Hari Radha Marhava Kunjabi Hari Sisi Radha Madhava Ki Jai Giri Raj Maharaj Ki Jai Jashoda Mai Ki Jai Kunjabi Hari Ki Jai Bajajana Ranjana Ki Jai Jamuna Devi Kije. The nine twelve force of Vrindavan Kije. Srila Prabhupada Kije. Go Premanandi Hari Hari. Right now, my daughter's at Govardhan. I am so jealous of her. I don't know how I'll ever overcome this jealousy. I'll have to go to Vrindavan. And then I'll be there and sh when she's back in America, and then she'll be jealous of me. That's okay. So, before we begin, I want to tell you something that I read that relates to our topic. So, our topic is called spiritual bypassing, which is the avoidance of issues, uh, of issues more what we would say our human side, our conditioned nature, avoidance of issues in the name of, kind of, you could say, hiding behind spiritual practices and spiritual philosophy to avoid the issue. So as many of you know, uh, what we do as human beings to deal with uncomfortable feelings is we suppress them, repress them, put them in the closet, lock the door, pretend they don't exist, or bury them so deeply we're not consciously aware that they're there. There's been a lot of study about this, and the studies show that uh, suppressed anxiety turns up as physical disease. And what I find so interesting about this is that what the alternative healers say is about, is about 90% of disease is, is caused by stress. And that's exactly what Prabhupada said. And probably Prabhupada was quoting, a lot of times when he talks about health, he's referring to some Ayurvedic aphorism or understanding. So Prabhupada said, regulation, cleanliness. He said, irregulation, uncleanliness, and anxiety is the cause of disease. And in, in one time he said, but about 90% of the disease is caused by stress, anxiety. 
So I had uh, I had read a report when I was studying to create my forgiveness workshop. Maybe that was probably 17 years ago. And what the research found is that when people don't forgive, the resentment, which sometimes is not conscious, you don't always know you're, if you're resentful, sometimes you can lie to yourself and say, I'm not. Have you ever lied to yourself? Have you ever lied to yourself about lying to yourself? Think about that one. I lie to myself that I about the fact that I don't lie to myself when I actually do lie to myself. So I'm lying to myself about lying to myself. Yeah. It gets pretty strange when you analyze the mind. So, but the report I read was that it's like forgiveness is a long-term form of rage, but it's very subtle. It's a long, excuse me, revenge. It's it's ang basically anger but it's subtle, but the problem is it's constant. So there's this, this anger that you've suppressed and it, it's, it's wearing out your immune system. So it's, um, and at, the, at that time when I was studying this, that kind of research was just beginning, there wasn't a lot. And now there's a lot. So we were talking about one of the things we can do is um, pretend we don't have a problem, but actually it's stressing us or pretend we um, or ignore our feelings because we don't know what to do with them. Uh, and if we, if we feel, we might become discouraged. But um, that often causes disease. And the other thing we've talked a lot about is the, the fact that we're not perfect. And especially if you want to be perfect or you have the nature of, of a perfectionist, not being perfect is a cause of a lot of stress because you just want everything to be perfect, including your spouse, yourself, the president, every corporation, every individual on the planet, and obviously they're not. And so it, it can be very it can be very stressful. So when we become devotees, we, we're trying to be perfect. We're trying to be self-realized. We're trying to love Krishna. And it's, as you know, it happens more slowly than you originally anticipated. How long does a trip take? We'll get there in eight hours. You know, 25 years later, you're still on the trip that you thought was eight hours. You know, that we all experience that. Well, I will, be, I joined the Bakhtin program. I should be self realized in three weeks or three months or six months or, you know, some, you know, at least within a year. And then when that time comes, you realize, though, it's, it's much longer. It's much longer. And then, what can happen at that point is you start thinking, well, there must be something wrong with me because I calculated it would take three months. Now it's three years and I'm not anywhere near it. And then you could doubt if you'll ever get near it. But my point is, it, in, in many devotees, uh, maybe we could say all devotees on some level, well, I don't want to say all, but many, most, it naturally causes some guilt, uh, like what's wrong with me, or I'm letting my spiritual master down, or I'm letting the devotees in the temple down, I'm letting myself down. Uh, I'm not perfect. Uh, you know, you can go to school and get all A's, but you can't join a spiritual movement and get all A's in purity. It doesn't work the same way. So a lot of people are thrown off by that, because those of you who are very successful materially, probably were successful at everything you tried to do until you became a devotee. And now you're you're thinking, I'll become a devotee, I'll do the same thing. And I got straight A's in school, top of this, top of that. And I knew one devotee who, who left ISKCON because he was like top in everything he did. And it, you know, he wasn't the top in controlling his senses when he joined ISKCON. I mean, nobody really is. And, you know, he had these expectations that he would he would be top a top devotee and it didn't work out exactly as planned because you can't do it materially. And he just left Krishna consciousness. He was, he was very discouraged. And so, you know, that's one way of dealing with shame and guilt, just leave, then you don't have to deal with it anymore, right? <clears throat> you ever see that? Sometimes you get mad. At, oh, I'm not gonna play this game. Oh, well, let's solve the problem. That, now you don't have to lose the game because you were losing. If you just leave, you won't lose, right? You're cheating me. It's not fair. <clears throat> you ever seen people do that? 
it's, you know, you're cheating, it's not fair, you know, you're not supposed to win. What do we call them? Bad losers. And the good losers are like, congratulations, you beat me, you did a good job. But anyway, um, we know what shame and guilt is on the spiritual path. So it's a problem here because if we, if we suppress it and we don't deal with it and work through it, then we can think we don't have it when we actually do. And it's causing problems. I'm just talking here about the physical level. It's obviously causing problems on the mental, emotional level, but on the physical level. And um, it can turn up as disease and you'll go to a million doctors and they'll give you a million drugs and it won't cure you because there's a fundamental disease. So I haven't talked about this that much. We've talked about the mental psychological uh, way of correcting this, but I haven't talked about the physical. So I just decided I would scare you. I would, I would, I would begin class by scaring you. So I hope I've scared you enough to um, understand that your anxiety the anxiety, the guilt, and et cetera, you may be experiencing in your effort to be a perfect devotee and falling short is extremely unhealthy, not only spiritually and emotionally, but physically. And it can show up in all kinds of things, all kinds of diseases that the doctor will just give you this drug and that drug, which will make you sicker. Now, I have some good news for you. Now that I've got you completely frightened about the fact that you're going to get sick tomorrow. But I want to tell you a story, <clears throat> and this will perk you up, two stories. Some of you may know that in 2000 and probably four, I fractured my hip and I had to have a minor surgery where, they, where the hip was cracked. It was very, very painful. I couldn't stand. I, I cracked it. I was on the ground. It was really difficult just to stand up. I had to hold on and to move it. It's crazily, crazy painful. Anyway, so I went to see an orthopedic surgeon a few hours after it happened, and he came out and said, we've booked you, your surgery is going to start in a few hours. I'm like, really? That wasn't on my to-do list for today. Anyway, so they, they stuck a pin in there, a screw, I guess. It's a, what's that metal? I forgot. Who knows what titanium, there's a titanium screw in my hip. If you ever do an MRI or x-ray on me, you'll see it. There it is. So the doctor said, you're probably going to need a hip replacement within 10 years you know, at the most. So we know uh, if you do the math, that was 2004. So, you know, 10 years of 2014. So we're at 17 years now. When he said that, my mind reacted and said, no, no way. That's never going to happen. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to need a hip replacement. <clears throat> I can't say why I thought that, but I, 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 it's a hard time. I have a hard time thinking of my body not working properly. It's just, I don't know. It's just the way I am. <clears throat> so if any doctor says you're going to be sick of this or that, my mind <clears throat> it reacted. It reacts against it, says, no, that's not going to happen. Anyway, um, I never had the operation, and the hip is fine. The other hip isn't so great, but the one with the screw in, that is supposed to, I need a replacement, and it's fine. So it could be that my mind rejected that idea, and it just kind of healed it. Anyway, he explained why I would need the operation, and how this fracture would just keep, even though it's, it's stuck together with this screw. It'll just, the line will continue and grow and it'll be painful. Anyway, it didn't happen. So, um, and you also know about the placebo effect. And the interesting thing, what they found about the placebo effect is that you think you've taken the drug and you, you imagine what the drug's gonna do and your mind actually creates chemicals to heal your body sometimes exactly the same as the drug. It's, it's crazy. Anyway, so, but here's what I wanted to tell you, the, the really good news. You may have heard this story 
it's such a beautiful story. Prabhupada was with a disciple, and he said to the disciple, the disciple said, how can I serve you? And Prabhupada said, I want you to go where I cannot go. And the disciple said, well, you're traveling the world, you're going everywhere. Where is it that you cannot go? And Prabhupada said, I cannot go in the future, I won't be here. You can go in the future. So have you heard that story before? Some of you? Uh, yeah, I think only 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 Anuradha heard it, yeah. So it was just a kind of interesting way of saying, continue the preaching as I've been doing. And then Prabhupada said something, and Gabriella, write this down because this is for the course, this will be really good, at least at some point in the course. Prabhupada said, I want you to go where I can't go and preach, and I want you to tell the people that Krishna loves you. That's what I want you to tell them, Krishna loves you. I never heard that before, that Prabhupada is telling us to tell people that Krishna loves them. Isn't that nice? So I want you to all meditate on that. You, some of you know Amma. She's from South India, and she does programs where she hugs people. So everybody needs a hug, or we need so many hugs a day or something. You know? hugs, uh, hugs are good for health, and, and uh, devotees like to hug. And so when Prabhupada says Krishna loves you, it's like Krishna is hugging you. you know? that's, like, that's like a mental hug, isn't it? God loves me. And so people need to be loved, they need to feel loved. And that We can't exist without it. As you know, babies if, who aren't hugged don't do well, and some don't live if they're not hugged. So that's probably the most heal, one of the most healing thoughts that there is, that Krishna loves you. And of course, we've talked about this a lot. And the natural response is, why would he love me? Well, that's not for you to figure out. You know, it's like, I'm going to give Tanya a million dollars. And she's spending the whole night thinking, why did he give me a million dollars? I just don't understand. Just go out and spend it. Stop thinking. You know, what? It doesn't matter. You have, the, you have the million now. It's like, you know, maybe he's trying to bribe me. Maybe he loves me. Maybe he lost his mind. Well, whatever. You got the million dollars. Don't worry about it. Right? Go use it. Why would Krishna love me? And maybe Prabhupada didn't say that, or he didn't mean me. He means the other devotees, not me. Because if, if you know how bad I was, you would know that Krishna, even Krishna couldn't love me. You know, like Krishna could liber give liberation to Kamsa, but me, no way. He could liberate Sisupal, who all he did was criticize Krishna, but me, no. So it's not for us to try to figure out. That's just for us to accept it. And not only only to accept it as a philosophy, as a tattva, but to actually feel it. Because when you feel it, then you've actually accepted it. Because if you don't really feel it, you're gonna, your mind's going to, again, start doubting it. So now, also, think about this. If I could actually feel that Krishna loves me, like, without any doubt, how would I feel? How would that help my devotional service? Think about it. Think about someone who loves you. You naturally you respond to that love by wanting to love them, right? Now, if you think, why would Krishna love you? He really doesn't love you. Think about what that could do for your bhakti. It could actually undermine it, right? Could, maybe not necessarily, but it's not as healthy as a thought, not as enthusing, inspiring a thought. Not as motivating a thought as Krishna loves me, because if he loves me, I want to reciprocate. Right? Krishna, you love me, so let me reciprocate. This is a relationship. Um, I'm in the red right now. I have to get out of the red in love. So, um, and that is also one of the healthiest thoughts, that Krishna loves you. Now, I have seen, I'm sure you have seen also, but I think I've seen more of the shame and guilt and anxiety that comes from what we would consider failing Prabhupada, 
failing Krishna, failing our spiritual master. But um, I've said this before, but I want to say it again because we're talking about it. That Prabhupada never made us feel that way. In fact, he always he always made us feel the opposite. And if he corrected us, it's because we were going off course. It wasn't so. He has to shame us back on course. No, it was just that, that you went the wrong way. There's nothing about you. It's like you're just going the wrong direction. It's not a statement that you're stupid or incapable. It was just a correction, a course correction. That's all. But we interpret it that way. Oh. I'm worthless, I'm useless, what's the point, et cetera, et cetera. Never Prabhupada's intention, never, never, if you actually analyze how he dealt with the devotees, was there any ind indication that he was trying to make them feel that way, neither any indication that what he said or did should make them feel that way unless they have an extremely guilty conscience. But in fact, what he did was to make us feel the opposite way, accepted. Krishna loves you. I will give you mercy. I will never reject you as long as you're sincere. Prabhupada said that our service is so teeny and Krishna is so big, there's nothing you can do to impress him. But he sees your sincerity. And so we've talked about this also, that, you know, I may not, not do so, such great service, but even if I do great service, in comparison to what Krishna does from his perspective, great service is it, it's not the great service that's impressive. It's the great sincerity. And we, you know, you, you say, well, you're saying we should love Krishna, but I don't have love yet. Well, just be sincere. That's that in the stage of Bhaiti Bhakti, this, your sincerity is the best thing you can offer. That's the closest thing to love before you actually have it. That's the best thing you can offer. So if Krishna loves me, and I allow myself to feel loved without feeling um, berating myself for my faults, but feeling accepted by Krishna um, and being sincere and trying to serve, then that's what Prabhupada wants. And then that, that shame and guilt, which does not help us, will go away. Now you might, someone might say, well, shouldn't I feel guilty if I'm continually uh, falling short? It depends what falling short means. What, I didn't distribute 100 Bhagavad Gita today, only 99, I should feel guilty? Of course not. If I'm continually breaking principles, well, I should do something about it. And while I'm doing something about it to improve, feeling guilty doesn't make any sense because I'm, I'm doing what I can. It would be like being sick and beating yourself up for being sick. Although you're, you've changed your diet, you're exercising, you've changed your mentality, you're doing everything. I'm so bad, I'm sick. I'm a bad person. God is cursing me. Yeah, you can think like that, but um, that's not going to help you. And um, it can actually cause you a lot of ill health. And so <clears throat> the reason this is important is because if we're going to spread Krishna consciousness, we want to make sure that the people that are becoming Krishna conscious, who would tend to feel this way, um, don't. We help them not feel this way because we don't want to create a, a movement of psychotics and erotics. You know, people who were like fine before they became devotees, and now after devotees, they're like depressed, psychotic, stressed, which can happen, right? You might have experienced it yourself at some point. we'd have to change the name, International Society for Neurosis Consciousness. And we all go around, oh, my rounds are so bad. My bhakti is so bad. I have no devotee. Yeah, so, you know, you read, you, you read Shastra and, and the pure devotee is saying, I have no devotion. I am so bad. I'm a, I'm a this and I'm that. And then, then you think, oh, that's how you're supposed to think. And you try to enter that mode and you end up like, and the mental hospital. So, you know, the Prabhupada said, don't imitate. But you all know what I'm referring to. So we, we want to create a society where people are happy. If they're in anxiety, the anxiety is transcendental. It's not the same, it's exciting. Another word for anxiety is excitement. 
there was an interview and they interviewed many, many Olympic athletes and they asked them, were you in anxiety before the event? And they said, no, I was excited. Did I tell this story? Yeah. No. They said, no, nobody said they were in anxiety. They all said they were excited. So, so then what they did is they interviewed people who, who in another situation said they were in anxiety. And they took their physical symptoms, their pulse, uh, the amount of sweat on their hands and so forth. And they did the same with the Olympic athletes who said they were excited, the physical symptoms were the same. So they're actually experiencing the same thing, but they gave it a different name and, and therefore it didn't degrade them. Excitement doesn't degrade you, anxiety does. Isn't that interesting? So it was actually the same experience. Yeah, you'll become a devotee, you'll be in anxiety, but that anxiety is your excitement to serve Krishna, to do things better. That's different. But the what we're talking about is, is the perception that something's wrong with me or I'm lacking in some way. And Krishna, you know, I'll, I'll never become Krishna conscious and Krishna will, will never show mercy. Um, a lot of times devotees ask for mercy, they ask for blessings. Um, especially Indians, it's part of the culture. They understand that everything is by God's grace. Um, but a lot of times when they ask for blessings, I like to answer and say that you already have so many blessings. And um, because it almost sounds like, please give me your blessings. What, you don't have any blessings? But Ekaterina, please give me your money. And she said, what, you don't have any money? So, no, I just need, I need a few dollars. I don't have any change I have to pay for something. You know, it's like, like, but if I did that all the time, you'd be thinking, what's wrong? He's always asking for money. He doesn't ha have any money. So please give me your blessings. Bless me, bless me. That's nice. But at the same time, you may overlook your blessings when you're asking for blessings. No, we're already blessed in so many ways. Why do you need more blessings? You have 80 books of blessings. You have 16 rounds of blessings. You have the Sangha of blessings, the Prasadam of blessings, the Kirtan of blessings. And you have your own um, effort as your blessing. So sometimes that mentality can be healthy, but sometimes it could not be healthy. It can be coming from misunderstanding or thinking that I'm not blessed, I need to be blessed. And, you know, one of the greatest blessings you can give yourself. Oh, Gopinath, can you stand up so we can see that he's talking now? This is how you bless yourself. When he stands, when Gopinath stands up, you'll see how to. Gopinath, can you stand up so we can see your sh shirt? Don't judge yourself, love yourself. Yeah, that's one way you bless yourself. You can also get that t-shirt. It is available. Now a word from our sponsor on sattvaaccessories.com. Um, I have to apologize though, that because we are not printing these shirts in large quantity, they are, you order and they print. So it's like kind of double the price what you would expect. So that's probably like $30, that sweatshirt, right? Yeah, and t-shirts are like 17 to 20 or something. That's just... They're at sattwaapparel.myspreadshop.com. It's Christmas time, everyone. I'm going to get a package soon of all the shirts. So I'm going to do a commercial and I'll, I'll wear all the shirts and explain. And so you'll get, uh, you'll get to see. And the, 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 so Gopinath, do people ask you about that? Do they read that and go, cool, I like that? You ever get a chance to talk to them? Mostly here in the work, like, hey, what is it? It's like, hey, it's his great Mahama Prabhu merchandising. That's what I say. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you should explain. You should explain what it is. So, um, yeah. So Krishna consciousness is a form of self-blessing, but you could also self-curse. Um, Violence means to interfere with a person's spiritual advancement. This is Prabhupada's definition of violence. If you have thoughts that impede your spiritual advancement, that's violence to yourself. So you're not blessing yourself. Please, 
you're doing violence to yourself and you're asking me for blessings. That's a paradox, right? Please bless me. Yeah, I bless you that you stop cursing yourself. How about that? I bless you that you stop being using violent thoughts. I, I bless you that you stop having violent thoughts. What are violent thoughts? Thoughts that are impeding your spiritual progress. Those are violent thoughts. You can write that down for your course. I just did a video on that. Violent thoughts. I mean, that's within the context, the mind is the friend or enemy, but putting it that way, um, I think is more powerful. It's like, I have violent thoughts. I have thoughts that are violent, therefore they're self-destructive. I have violent thoughts. What does violence do? It destroys people. My thoughts are destroying me. I'm allowing myself to have destructive thoughts and I'm asking for blessings. Can you bless me so I don't have destructive thoughts? That's okay. How about bless yourself? and stop having destructive thoughts. I think that would be better than depending on someone else else's blessings. Of course, we know everything depends on the blessings of Guru. So that's there. I don't want to undermine that or minimize that. But sometimes I think we use that to avoid responsibility. Just give me your blessing. I can't do anything without your blessing. Then I give you a blessing. Okay, now everything's good. And, I, and then you think, I don't have to do anything. I've got the blessings. So that way the blessings would be counterproductive. Right? Oh, now I got my guru's blessings. That's good. So I sit back and relax and do nothing. No. But you will, you will see, and you probably have have already seen, that you need to be blessing yourself all the time by taking advantage of the blessings that already have been given. You know, Guru Dave, give me your blessings. What about the last thousand I gave you? What happened to them? <clears throat> Oh, oh, really? You gave me a thousand blessings? Yeah. You know, I've spoken at least a thousand words in the last week. A thousand blessings. Something like that. But to speak of all the words Prabhupada spoke and all the other Vaishnavas in the classes, and you know, it's like thousands and thousands of blessings all the time. You're not lacking in blessings. Maybe lacking in taking advantage of them. That's another thing. Okay, that was an introduction to today's class. That was kind of a long introduction, but I think it was important. So, oh, I read an example last night. Um, I, 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 have, I had a problem yesterday. It gets dark here around 5.30. In the summer, it gets dark at 9.30. So my body thinks it's time to go to sleep. So I chanted a long Gayatri. It lasts about an hour. You ever done an hour Gayatri? I my body thought it was time to go to sleep because the sun was setting. So I chanted Gayatri and then I woke up and it was 6.30. And um, at one o'clock at night, I was trying to go to sleep and I couldn't. I couldn't. I was just wide awake. I was doing things, reading and working on this and that. Forced myself to sleep at two o'clock. So, but anyway, I got to read something that God's sister has written. This is a new book. It's not out yet. But she gave an example in the book that I really liked. So she said, imagine you're on the second, third floor of an apartment or whatever floor. It's not the ground floor, you're up. And you need to go down. And so you point to the spot down and figure, figuratively, you call that spot perfection. So let's say we put a little, a little sign there, perfection, right? And you're on the balcony. And so she asks, what's the quickest way to get to that spot? And the quickest way is to jump. So I think we talked about this on Monday. Um, did we talk about sustainability? How you, if you want to, yeah. So jumping is not sustainable because you'll end up in the hospital. So that's right. So, so that was the example. Well, the best, let's just jump you know, without thinking, like, what are the consequences? I'm 19, I've been a devotee three weeks, let's take sannyas, let's, you know, I'm ready to become GBC, you know, like that, that's like jumping. So she said, well, how do we get down here? And they say, well, we have to go out of the house, we have to either walk down the stairs or take the elevator, 
And then we have to walk out of the apartment and we have to go out into the yard and walk there, right? So she was making a comparison, which I really liked. She said that when you become a devotee and you realize that you have to walk, get to the elevator, push the button, get in the elevator, push the button, go down, like it's taking so long, get out of the elevator, elevator, and I figure, do I go left or right? Which way? Where's that sign? Yeah, that's, that's the process of bhakti. Takes time, right? And so a lot of devotees would just rather jump. They don't, they think, oh, this takes so long. I don't want to do it. It takes so long. It's so, you know, so. Uh, and so her point was that sooner or later, you know, and the best time to do it would have been yesterday if you haven't done it yet, is just acknowledge that it's going to take time. And according to how fast I can walk down the stairs, and some of you can walk faster than others. But you can't jump because that's not going to work. Uh, or some of you have elevators, some of you don't. Some of you can run down the stairs, but the realization of this is how fast I can go down, just accept it. That's a reality. Part of the problem that causes us stress is that, is that we don't accept reality. This is, have you ever been in a situation and you just go, I can't accept this? You don't say it, but but that's what's actually happening. You just, I can't, I can't accept that this is a reality. I don't want it to be this way, so I can't accept it. And at the same time, you can't accept it, but it's how it is. So it's, it doesn't make any sense because you're not accepting, you ever been stuck in traffic and you're late and you're not accepting it? Well, it doesn't make the traffic move faster. You've probably noticed that, right? <clears throat> well, if I just don't accept it, the cars will get out of the way. No, that's never happened. Maybe you know some mantra. I don't know. I haven't learned that mantra to move cars. So uh, I like the example. You know, it's just okay. It's going to take a while to get to perfection. There's some stairs to go down. And um, once you accept it, then everything's okay. You just accept that's how long it's going to take. And then everything balances. First time my daughter was on an airplane after she's flying to India or somewhere. I think flying to India. It's like five. So after like two hours, he said, So can we get out now? You know, 13, 14 hour flight. Can we get off the plane now? She didn't know. So do you ever feel like that? Like, um, are we there yet? No, it's only two hours. The flight's 14. No, we're not there yet. You mean it's going to take, yeah, it's going to take longer. So, so, so her point was, you can't do that unless there's self-acceptance, just acknowledgement. This is, this is how fast I can walk, and this is how long it's going to take if I walk at that speed. Of course, I can walk faster if I practice, but right now, this is how fast I'm walking. So I like that example. I thought it was nice. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we're going to begin reading from where we left off. And so what we read yesterday was basically this man, what's his name? John Wellwood is saying that yeah, you have these samskars and karmic conditioning, and it's like you can't move beyond it before you move beyond it. <laughs> That's basically okay. Well, it explains that trying to move beyond our psychological and emotional issues by sidestepping them is dangerous. It sets up a debilitating split between our transcendent self and the human within us, leading to a conceptional, one-sided kind of spirituality, 
where one pole of life is elevated at the expense of its opposite. In other words, you're, there's this concept that I've shared with you before. It's called succeeding by failing, which is different than success, failure is a pillar of success. It's a totally different concept. What it is is that in order to put energy into succeeding in a cer certain area of your life, you have to do nothing in another area of your life. So, you know, a, a common example would be you succeed in your business at the cost of neglecting your family or the cost of neglecting your health or the cost of neglecting your other needs and you just focus on that. So, you know, if you want to start a company and be successful, be prepared to work 70 or 80 hours per week and have basically no relationships because that's what it takes because that's what the competition is doing. In case you, in case you ever think about it, that's what your competition is doing. That's how hard they're working. So, so you succeed, you can succeed, but you will succeed by failing in other aspects of your life. You'll have the money, the job success, the business success, you'll have the divorce, you'll have the bad health. And you've probably heard the saying, people work hard to make money and sacrifice their health. And then when they're older, they spend all their money that they made to regain their health. I think Dalai Lama said that. But the Dalai Lama said that. So that's what he's referring to, that in order to be, so we, we can use the same strategy. In order to be successful spiritually and put all my energy into spirituality, I will neglect my human side, my conditioned side. I will ignore it and not give it importance. Maybe neglect certain needs, maybe um, suppress certain emotions, which will come out later as use frustrations. Or for some people, the emotions, when they come out, they don't even know how to handle them because they, they don't, they, they've <clears throat> buried them so deeply and never dealt with them. They don't know what to do with them when they come out. And it can create a you know dark night of the soul type situation. So I have found repeatedly that only temporarily is it ever valuable to minimize something to succeed at something else. Okay, I gotta get it done this week, even this month. But to do that consistently. It creates problems and you, you it's kind of like if i were to visually show you what it's like it's kind of like your life is like this it's like out of balance you know what, what what's wrong with you oh i'm working over here all the time well don't you ever work over there no only here so because i don't work over there my head is off to this side if i work both sides <clears throat> then my head is straight you ever feel like that sometimes and it leads to burnout. So you, you're you like forced to go back to the other side. But by the time you go to the other side, you've drained yourself. So it's going to take a lot more energy to balance it. Prevention is always better than cure. It's easier. So I've talked about balance. And you can see on we did a whole series on balance for the Russian devotees. But it's a simple concept. Don't succeed at something by failing at something else. Succeed by keeping balance. In the long run, it's better for you and better for everyone around you. Yeah. Okay, I have my service. I'm going to neglect my sadhana. I'll get more service done. Oh, I'm just going to do sadhana. I'm not going to do any service. Both, both of those things, in my, in my mind, reflect an imbalance in a person's consciousness and mind. Now, someone may be very old, very elevated, and they're just, now they're Babaji's and they're just hearing and chanting, and they've done preaching their whole life. That's different. But at a younger age, to overly focus on any one thing, even, even the obsession with being brahmachari or not being brahmachari, that it's not balanced because the world is not made up only of brahmacharis or only of grihastas, or only of sannyasis. There's a balance there. So I, I always noticed, even before I even thought seriously about what balance means, <clears throat> I always noticed 
what did I say, before I contemplated the whole concept of balance, I always noticed that Prabhupada was the personification of balance. He was, you would never see him harping on one extreme, on the edge of extreme, and not bringing, bringing it back to center by explaining the other side. So sometimes we do that. <clears throat> Maybe you don't, but some do, where we harp on one side without explaining the other side, or one action without the opposite balancing action. So that's what he's talking about. So some people just have that mentality. So naturally, when they come to spiritual life, that's what they're going to do. They'll minimize everything but the spiritual. Sometimes they'll become ill. And then they can become emotionally ill. Then they can burn out, etc. And then they can burn other people out when they burn out. That's also another consideration. If you burn out, you'll likely burn other people out in some way or upset the people close to you. So out of mercy to the people close to you, you need to be healthy, right? Because if you get sick, everyone has to take care of you. If you're emotionally sick, it's problematic also. So be kind to the people near to you and be normal. You know, my mission in life is to help devotees become normal. I would never say that when I was young. My mission when young was like to help everyone become abnormal. I thought that was so cool to be abnormal. In my old age, I've made compromises. I guess. Um, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, so let's read some more. Let's see what we find here. Absolute truth is favored over relative truth. The impersonal over the personal. Transcendence over embodiment and detachment over feeling. So that's interesting. He he's making the observation that detachment or quote unquote so-called detachment can be the cause of shutting down emotionally not feeling what you're feeling what are you feeling over you not i don't know what i'm feeling you don't know what you're feeling well if you're from chile you know what you're feeling but okay you're from england what are you feeling i don't know what i'm feeling you're from sweden what are you feeling i don't know i'm feeling cold that's all i know yeah um What do you mean by feel? What are you feeling? What do you mean by feeling? I know what I'm thinking, but I don't know what I'm feeling. So, but feelings, you see, as we were discussing, we're a very philosophical movement, but feelings have their own intelligence as well. But as devotees, we kind of think feelings are just like the side that has no intelligence, isn't it? It's like it's either you're intelligent or you're feeling. And if you're feeling, and not using intelligence, that means you're a woman. Okay, you got it? That means you're a woman. And you know, and ladies, you have to be like men. So be like men and don't feel and just use your intelligence. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Welcome to the Hare Krishna movement. We're gonna turn all the women into thinking men. And we're gonna turn all the men into stones. Don't feel, because if you feel, it's maya, because you're going to feel maya, right? So we're not talking about feeling maya. We're just talking about feeling what you're feeling, which, which I think a lot of people don't understand this, and this is why we had that problem I just discussed, is that feelings guide you. Feelings can often guide you. Oh, you're totally in maya, and, you know, hormones are shooting left and right and you're you know acting incoherent i'm not talking about that but i'm talking about normal nor, uh, normal emotions and day-to-day -day interactions um even the negative emotions we don't like feeling they have there's guidance you get from them there's intelligence they they're saying something they're talking to you they're they're allowing you to process it 
you know that feeling you get when you're supposed to do something, you feel like, I feel really good about this. I feel like this is going to go well, or I feel like it's not going to go well, right? Do you ever shut down those feelings? Do you ever have that experience? Kind of like, I want it to go well, so I'm not, but I have this sense that working with this person, maybe it's not a good idea, but I want to, sh I shut down that feeling, and then I find out later, actually, it was the right feeling. I'm talking about things of that nature, or when I feel guilty, of course, I talked about uh, we shouldn't dwell on guilt, but sometimes we feel guilty because it's normal to feel guilty because we did something wrong. So that guilt is clarifying something to us. And so we start thinking, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. Or I have feeling that I feel guilty because what I'm doing could lead to something terribly bad. And so that guilt prevents you from going further. It, it causes you to turn around. If you shut that down, you don't get that guidance. Mm. Or maybe you're starting to burn out and you suppress it and then you later burn out. Whereas if you're feeling it and say, feeling I'm like, doing too much, I can't do this. I have to slow down a little bit. So you prevent yourself from burning out, right? So now in philosophical terms, that would be labeled as Prabhu, you're not surrendered, just surrender. Don't worry about how you feel, just surrender. It's just your mind. Have you ever heard that one before? Yeah, well, some cases it's true, but in the case we're talking about, it's not true, right? So it's, it's evading the issue. And then you're thinking, okay, after being told that, I should turn off my feelings because I'm just a neophyte, so all my feelings are Maya. In fact, everything I think is Maya. So probably I shouldn't think or feel, and I should just ask my guru, how should I think and how should I feel? And then we will have a 100% perfect academic um, <clears throat> textbook version of a cult. And none of you can think, feel, or act without asking your guru what to do. Guru Maharaj, should I eat half a cup of rice or a third a cup of rice? Guru Maharaj, should I eat one cup of dal or a cup and a half? Three chapatis or four? Yeah, so we've, we've created an organization of people who cannot think for themselves if we do that. <clears throat> and Prabhupada said, we should all be independently thoughtful. We should think for ourselves, right? So like, why do we have 80 books? So you, so you can keep asking what I should do. So you should keep asking, how do I put my shoes on? No, we have 80 books. So you have enough philosophy to make decisions and use your intelligence. <clears throat> so we, we don't want to deal with the devotees in a way that they would think that they can't trust their own feelings that would be bad, right? So that's what he's saying. Now, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just pointing out that this is not uncommon to think this way, because it's, it's like if you don't traverse the philosophy well, it looks like everything's Maya and everything I feel and think is Maya because I'm just a young devotee. And so, you know, but, but then what about the Dhammi Buddha Yogam Tam? Where Krishna says, I guide you from within. What about the, the purports where Prabhupada says the guru is, is helping you get in touch with super soul so you can be guided by the Cheta Guru? Yeah, so that's very important. Inspiration from within, right? Okay. It's almost time to read your questions or comments. And then there should be some from last week, right? So, John Wellwood says, one might, for example, try to practice non-attachment by dismissing one's need for love. But this only drives the need underground so that it often becomes unconsciously acted out in covert and possibly harmful ways instead. It, it can, um, you know, the need for love, the, the, is you suppress the need for love, and then it comes out with you're acting in ways to get people's appreciation. Or it may come out just as hardcore pride, you know, just straight pride. So, um, or 
you know, the need for acceptance and affection. And if I don't get it, I, I'm finished. I'm out of here. Hare Krishna movement is bogus. Nobody loves me. So um, there are healthy ways to fulfill needs and unhealthy ways. And I'm not saying the need for love is unhealthy, but there's unhealthy ways to get it, like arrogance. That's one way to get it. I knew somebody, he, uh, there was this guy, he lived in Washington, D.C. You might have seen him. He, he did a lot of things to get people to love him, and if they didn't love him, he didn't like them, and he would fire them. So that, it, it, that's an unhealthy way to get love. Of course, the healthy way to get love is to give it to others, right? You give it, you get it. And to um, and to love yourself. So love is not bad. We all need it, but there's unhealthy and healthy ways to get it. So what he's referring to here is just through detachment, just totally cutting it off. And then it comes out, you know, you're like super detached. And I've seen this. Um, with some a leader who's no longer with us, I've seen I've seen it, and it was to be loved and honored was very important for him, to the point that if he didn't get sufficient love and honor, he'd become kind of upset with you, and cranky and angry, and that's unhealthy for obviously for everybody. So let's read a little more. This dynamic may account for some of the challenges in our spiritual communities. I think so. This is, um, I think this is Ram Baru commenting. This dynamic may account for some of the challenges in our spiritual communities. The notion that our thoughts and feelings should be ignored because they are simply a product of Maya or the material energy. The no, this is the notion that we just discussed that. This notion can be helpful when we are trying to focus on devotional practices like hearing chanting deity worship. However, when it comes to managing our day-to-day -day life situations, these same ideas can be used to suppress and deny feelings or concerns that need our attention. So again, he's just, he's, the, the point is that there's, you know, obviously there's a place for detachment. There's a place for austerity. There's a place for mental, emotional control. But it often, often we think it's going to get in the way if we're not always extremely detached. But in specific situations, it doesn't work. I have experience of that. That if you, how would I describe this? What's being said here is that this kind of detachment, it works very well in certain settings, in the spiritual settings. But you ever had a relationship with someone who's very detached? That's really difficult because they don't care. Hey, you want to do something tomorrow? Whatever. I don't care. Well, don't you like me? I like everybody. You know, there's like, there's like it's, it doesn't work. If you don't believe me, try marrying someone really detached. Do you love me? Honey, I don't love anybody. I'm just full of lust. I don't know how to love. You know, it's like, it, mommy, do you love me? Uh, love's a big word, you know. Uh, I don't know how to love. You know, you, in those kinds of dealings, then it becomes dysfunctional. So, so it's not like it's always dysfunctional. It ha obviously has its place but its application may extend too far outside of the spiritual realm to the point where it's just weird. Your husband's going off to, the, to you know, he's in the military, he's going off. Of, I may never see you again, you may die. I'm at the body, or just stop crying. See ya, Haribo. 
Now, some of you may say, oh, I'd like to have a husband like that. He's very Krishna conscious. So if you're that Krishna conscious, yeah, it'll work. If you're that transcendental, but most people aren't yet on that level. And um, Prabhupada wasn't like that anyway. You know that story? When Prabhupada had sent Brahmananda and Gargamuni. I think they one may have gone to Bangladesh, which was East Pakistan. And one had gone to Pakistan, and then there were some riots and wars. And then there was a newspaper article that some American devotees were killed. So Prabhupada thought Brahmananda was killed and Gargamani was killed. Um, they weren't, but Prabhupada didn't know that. And Gargamani and Brahmananda were the first, among the first devotees. And Brahmananda was very close to Prabhupada, did so much service for him, both of them. Fortunately, they both got out in time and they went to meet Prabhupada. I don't know where, Mayapur, Mumbai, something like that. When Prabhupada saw them, it was like surprise. He thought they were dead and he just embraced them. Yeah. It was like, oh, they're here. So obviously there's, a, you know, there's ways to express spiritual emotion and there's ways to express emotion that could be not helpful, but we, we see Prabhupada expressing emotion in, in different situations with his disciples, lots of emotion, that's for sure. So let's look at your questions. Do we have the questions from, La, from Monday? Okay. Are they on the top or what? In the bottom. Okay, so I'm going to go from the bottom up. Thank you for brilliant wisdom. I have a question. When Guru can rebuke disciple, what to do when Guru rebukes unnecessary? What reaction leader is abusing his position? Oh, wow. We need a whole class for that. Um, there, there, nobody has the right to abuse anybody. That's the first point. Now, a spiritual master has a right to correct, but within the context of, of that correction actually being beneficial. Because if I correct you, but it doesn't help you, then I haven't corrected you. So it's, not, it's my right to correct you. Yeah, but the way you did it just made it worse. Didn't correct anything. So do I have a right to rebuke does a guru have a right to rebuke a disciple? Yes. Will he rebuke? Not necessarily, because he'll consider what's best. He wants to train them. So if that's going to help them, he'll rebuke. If he sees that rebuking is not going to help and they need, they need something else, then he'll do that. But nobody, but if we're talking about abusing, no one has a right to abuse anyone. Not because you're a leader, you have a right to abuse. That's crazy. Um, sometimes men abuse their wives because they think they have a right because they're the husband. And sometimes leaders think think that also. But uh, whatever happened to Trinata Pisunichina, we respect everyone. So as a leader, you're given you're given the responsibility of helping people advance, and you you use your discretion in how that is done. And uh, I have rebuked people because I've rebuked them after being speaking nicely to them because speaking nicely didn't work and the rebuking actually did work and I know it would work and it worked really well. So my motive to rebuke was just to help them and solve a problem, which it did. So that was good. So I made a good judgment. Uh, sometimes I rebuke and it's not taken well. So it was a bad judgment. And one, one devotee uh, mentioned this to me once. He asked me, did you, did you give a good class? And I said, yeah, it was a good class. And he said, did you teach well? And I, and I said, yeah. And he said, actually, your teaching well has nothing to do with it being a good class. Did the students learn? Because you might have taught well. In other words, you taught, you know, objectively speaking, you taught everything well. But if student, students didn't learn, then actually you're not a good teacher. So you are a good teacher, but you're not a good teacher. So um, I mentioned yes, yesterday, you may give the right instruction, it's the perfect instruction, but it's not the perfect instruction for this person or for this situation. 
So yeah, but I gave him the right instruction. Yeah, it was just the wrong instruction for that person or that situation. So, you know, the right instruction given in the right way, in the right circumstance to the right person. Right? And that could be rebuking and it could be not rebuking. But abusing, no one has a right to abuse anyone. Okay, Kamo Binayak asks, whether philosophy or religion was more dependable. Later clarified that by philosophy, he meant psychology. By religion, he meant practicing just the activities of bhakti. They go together. You know, um, the question of psychology is an interesting question because you can't avoid psychology because everyone has a psychology because we have a mind. And the Vedic psychology is the three modes of nature. So, and you understand how the three modes are affecting you and the actions that you do, which, which entangle you in, within the different modes and the consequences of those modes. And in order to succeed at something, you have to have a certain mindset. And if you don't naturally have that mindset, you have to develop it. And that may require someone guiding you and how to adjust your mind, how to adjust your attitude, how to reform your beliefs, how to heal some past or reformat bad habits, um, re reprogram and so forth. So that's all part of the process of bhakti. So when people say, you know, what about psychology? I don't, I never saw psychology as separate from Krishna consciousness. So it's like they're making it separate, but it's not. And they're saying psychology is the demon. We don't need it. But it's, you know, all right, throughout the modes of nature, then you don't need that. You don't need that philosophy. You don't need the philosophy of determination. Okay. Krishna says, you know, you should be determined. Uh, Rupa Goswami says determination. Enthusiasm, all right. How can I be determined when I'm not? How can I be enthusiastic when I'm not? This is the realm of psychology. Then we have to start looking. Why are you not determined? Why are you not enthused? Is there something that would inspire you? You have, you have this, you know, fear of failure. You can't, you're afraid to do anything because if you fail, you'll beat yourself up and you'll never get out of bed the next day. That's all psychology. And so, if, if you actually look at the preaching that we do in our movement, especially the preaching to help devotees in relationships and help them, you know, remain determined despite the problems of it's so much of it is psychology and we're, we don't have to be psychologists. Um, and that's, well, the, if you're not a psychologist, you wouldn't realize it's psychology. If you're a psychologist, you'd say, oh, here's psychology. So to say we don't need it, it has no place. To me, it's, it's just, well, you, maybe you, you don't define that as psychology. Maybe you define as psychology, you know, analyzing, you know, personality disorders or something. Um, but I have a broader definition. It's, it's just the workings of the mind and the emotions, thinking, feeling, willing. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it does. So let's go back to the top. Bart says, I felt that, whatever that is, because we're not answering the question, the chat in real time. So next time, whenever you say that or it, I know it, I understand that, put in what it was so we'll remember. Uh -huh. Now we get some advice from our in-house in, in psychologist. We have a few in-house psychologists with us today. So if you're feeling crazy, just write it down and they'll cure you. They'll tell you what to do. One way to identify the lack of emotional connection of a person with him herself is that in his, her language, he, she usually uses the phrase, I think instead of I feel when we ask about his or her emotions. Yeah. How do you feel about this? I think. <laughs> they'll ask you how you feel. Yeah, I know you asked how I feel. So what I think about how I feel is, <laughs> is that what you're saying, Gabriel? You ask them how they feel and they'll tell you how they think about how they feel. Yeah. 
That's fine. Yeah, so, yeah. There's nothing wrong with thinking as long as you also feel. You could analyze your feelings, then it's getting a little weird. I mean, if that's all you do, okay. Balancing material and spiritual life, part one, there's the link. It's in the chat if you, if you wanna look at it. Gopinath says, I've been sad lately for some personal reasons and I have been chanting more rounds, getting up at 6.30. Is this bypassing? How to know, because it feels sincere. If it lasts, it's genuine. If it doesn't last, it's bypassing. No, not necessarily. Um, it's not bypassing if you acknowledge the problem. Um, <clears throat> bypassing would mean that chanting is, is insufficient to solve it, and you're not going to do anything. Bypassing would mean you don't acknowledge it, which you have. And secondly, that the chanting is not solving the problem and you're not doing anything else to adjust your mind and heart to solve it. If you are, then you're not bypassing. And if the chanting is, if the chanting is working, you're not bypassing. Because, you know, for devotees, a lot of depression comes from the fact that we're not doing Krishna consciousness right. So doing Krishna consciousness well removes the depression. And then if you're a devotee, if you become depressed because you're not doing Krishna consciousness right, and to be a devotee means you should be happy and you understand I should be happy, then you become depressed about being depressed and it's double trouble, right? I'm depressed, I shouldn't be depressed, I'm a devotee and I'm depressed that I'm depressed. Um, okay. Ekaterina says, I found your point about the tendency to suppress emotional and emotions and use them to guide us instead, very helpful. Uh, recently, I've been a bit overwhelmed in prioritizing my work and life, spiritual life over rest and recreation for a short time I had, I had to, but I'm gradually moving towards including more recreation in my schedule and enough sleep, I will listen to your classes on balance because I feel that is just what I need right now. And it's in Russian also, so you can hear it twice. If you're Russian, you get to hear this twice, and then you can write me and say, that translator, they got it all wrong, or they got it all right. I sent my question on WhatsApp voice message. I'm driving. Okay. Hold on. There's this question. Hare Krishna, dear Mahatma Prabhu, please accept my most humble obeisances, all glories to Shla Prabhupada, all glories to you. I'm listening to your class, and um, the first question, uh, the devotee uh, spoke about the uh, need of love, and then you uh, tackle the questions from different angles. I just want to ask you, uh, because you mentioned uh, a devotee who is detached. Um, but the examples you gave, uh, they seem a little uh, more like a cynicism. I was thinking because Krishna is the most detached, is one of his uh, opulences, but he's never mean. He, he never uh, hurt the feelings of his devotees. And when the husband said, um, supposingly, allegedly, uh, well, I'm not about a, maybe I'm not coming back from war, but I don't care. Or you said, uh, oh, do you love me? Oh, I love everybody, or I don't love anybody because I'm full of lust and this and that. Um, maybe you could explain a little more the difference between a real Krishna conscious devotee, she or he, who has a real detachment, uh, which is cultivated through the 
a lot of service and a lot of knowledge and um, experience uh, through realization and just falsely being detached, being neglectful and cynical. I don't know if we uh, managed to get this question um, uh, before you start the class, but I think it's... Um, I got it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So we'll use two examples. Very good question. We'll use two examples. We we'll use Krishna and we'll use the devotee. And I was being a little sarcastic, but uh, at the same time, these are real examples of extreme, of extremely unbalanced devotees. It's not common, but in the 70s, not uncommon. I'll say that maybe. And more common in some parts of the world than others. Less common today because we've grown up. No, Krishna is detached, which means well, Krishna's detachment doesn't impede his affection for his devotees. Whereas unhealthy detachment could shut us down. So Krishna's detachment, because it's not unhealthy, doesn't shut him down. So what, what we're discussing is misunderstood detachment, misused detachment, unhealthy detachment, detachment that is, is actually blocking us from, uh, from dealing with who we are and um, or a kind of detachment which is causing us to be insensitive or deny our humanness. So, although Krishna's op, one of his opulences is, is that of detachment, complete detachment, because he's self-satisfied, but at the same time, he has extreme affection for his devotees. So his, it's a healthy detachment. It's not a deta he's not detached from affection. He's not detached from the emotions he expresses with his devotees because it's not an unhealthy detachment. So, but, I mean, that's a good example for us because it shows us a balanced kind of detachment. And then, then let's look at devotees who are very detached, like uh, Kardama Muni. So he is very detached. He's a yogi, devotee doing, we say yogi meaning austere. And his wife did austerities with him. And then at a, at a certain point, he felt compassion for her. And he, she wanted a child. And, and so he gave up his simple life in the forest and gave her a child. And, you know, did what he needed to do to satisfy her. So um, we saw that with... Um, with uh, Um, Priyavrata Maharaj, that he was married, he wanted to remain brahmachari, but in order to rule the kingdom, he had to marry, so he did it. And he was detached. But, and Prabhupada points out that even though he was detached, it didn't show up as any kind of lack of affection for his wife or children. He showed much affection for them. And it, it was in a sense, um, affection that was needed to nourish the family and to keep the wife happy, but it wasn't affection that was coming because he was attached on a bodily level. That was the point. But even though he wasn't attached on a body level, he didn't neglect to show those the human emotions that were needed by his daughter and his wife and children, which is interesting, right? So it was a very controlled, it's a very controlled kind of detachment. And, and I think it's safe to say that the detachment that's being discussed in this article is not really detachment. It's just an avoidance in the name of detachment. So if we understand that, that answers your question, right? I'm so detached that I don't even care about my wife. 
Krishna says the devotee is one who puts no one into difficulty. Well, if I'm going off to war, my wife's, but you may never come back. Whatever, I'm not the body. Um, that's putting her in extreme stress that he doesn't even care if he dies, which makes her think, he goes, he's probably going to uh -huh, just not even worry about dying and take all kinds of scary chances when maybe he doesn't have to. And so now he's putting her into distress. So your detachment is not going to cause you to become insensitive. It's not going to cause you to put others into difficulty. But when the detachment is artificial, then it might. That's the point. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Sardia Rasa wants to ask a question. So you can you can ask now. We're ready for you. Thank you so much for class. So I have a question about the importance of balancing thinking and feeling. Um, yeah. I, I once attended a course on nonviolent communication with a devotee and I found the course very helpful and she also spoke about the importance of you know, not being emotionally disconnected and but then at some point in the course um, you know because she was like trying to teach us to express what we feel and not what we think mm -hmm. so at some point in the course I asked the question um, I asked like you know if you notice you're emotionally disconnected what techniques can you use like in the moment and she gave um, an example and then she said like you know she asked me to respond to that and then I just said like I think that is very practical and then she was very upset with me and she said but you should tell me what you feel and then I said but I, I was like but I don't feel anything about this I just think it's it, it's it's practical so I was because that made me wonder about like are some I mean is it safe to say that some of us are more inclined to think yeah. more and some of us are inclined to feel more and is that all right because there's many things but i just don't have any feeling about it and i'm not necessarily think okay. i'm not necessarily sure if that is a bad thing or that's just like you know we have different natures okay. you know my little joke when someone at a japa workshop or retreat says i didn't feel anything and then i ask him well how did that feel how did you're always feeling so i would ask you the same thing how does it feel not to feel <laughs> how do you feel right now talking about this because you're always feeling it's just you may not be aware of what you're feeling at that moment and maybe you maybe your answer was i i have no feeling about it <laughs> how does that feel does that make you feel like something's wrong with you that you don't feel anything about it or you like it sounds like what you're saying no i feel fine not feeling but um yes it's true some people are more inclined to think um and some people are more inclined to feel but do you really think sardia rasa that you actually had no feeling or you just weren't aware of the feeling because it wasn't really any kind of polarized feeling one way or the other or you could I think say particular instance maybe i wasn't aware of what i'm feeling i'm just saying in, in general there's many experiences i have in life and i just don't have a strong feeling you know in that moment yeah yeah, yeah. um because i i mean i'm very philosophical by nature so i usually like for me i i experience things like and i for me it's like a philosophical experience more than like a yeah. emotional experience yeah well that could be the reason you weren't feeling <clears throat> you're analyzing which is which is that joke that i've told many times the professor goes to a party hangs around and then writes a report about what went on at the party while everyone was having a good time they were analyzing it so that's that academic view you know like like doesn't it doesn't it confuse you a bit that there are people who study bhakti as professors and they don't practice it and they know more than we do about it doesn't that seem a little seems weird to me have you ever thought like that sardi like like they're so into it and they don't practice it <laughs> so it could be a little bit of that also right maybe i'll leave that up to you to answer and if the answer is you think too much to feel, you can blame your mother. Because she probably does also. She's a professor, right? It's all her fault. 
Blame it on your mother. Only kidding. But yeah. Um, but is you know, that the, necessarily a, a, a problem if we, I mean, if we're more on the, as you said, like the analyzing side, less, less than the feeling side, is that necessarily a problem? Because that's the message I was getting from the Rebodi in the workshop is that, <laughs> you know, you should always, you should yeah. always be connected to your feelings. Yeah. Um, it could be a problem, especially if you marry and marry a very feeling person. They'll think something's wrong with you. I think if it's too much out of balance, it will be a problem. Because unless you marry, um, you marry another professor. You marry not another. You marry a professor. You you guys will be fine. You can just talk and analyze all the time. You can even analyze your relationship. <laughs> Oh, I have fun with professors. I probably would have become one, but they get paid for thinking. I said, that's, that's not fair. You get paid for thinking and reading, you know, and talking. Wow, that's a good job. And you don't have to feel guilty about that either, because if you did, you wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> I don't know, Sardia. Um, I hate to say, um, you have to feel, and if you don't feel, there's something wrong with you. And I would say the best answer to that question is utilize your analytical nature. But when you're in a relationship, be careful, it doesn't overcome, it doesn't you know, get out of balance. You know, I think there's an appropriate place for it and, and some places would not be appropriate. That's the best I would offer now. Does that help at all? Yes, no, it, it does. It does help. Um, I think that, yeah, the, as you said, the balance is key, given what, depending on what the situation is, it might be more ideal to, you know, give more, I would say, attention to either thinking or connecting with your feelings. Because in some situations, connecting with your feelings just isn't really useful. It's not practical. Like yeah. if you have to solve certain like practical problems, like how to fix your car, you just have to think. <laughs> yeah that's true everything is everything is contextual but some people maybe are too emotional not analytical enough some are too analytical um you know if it if it works in your i i don't i don't think it's fair to say someone's too intellectual or too emotional if that is working for them and it's not harming them or anybody else Yeah, and if you're too emotional and you work in academia, they probably laugh at you, right? So we have some from, is this from you, Tanya, or somebody else? It's from Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Okay, Radhe Radhe. What to do when emotional needs are being ignored when one is surrounded by karmic toxic people and intolerable situations? Then you have to. Fulfill them yourself. You have to find ways to fulfill your own needs if they're not fulfilled by other people. Gabriella, I know a person who always, when we ask him how his life has been, he evades the question, only talks about Krishna, and begins to preach about what the devotees have to do, what they don't have to do. One year has passed, and he continues to avoid the question it is something interesting to observe yeah that's interesting or he's a, or he's a pure devotee one or the other okay we have one minute once i had a talk with the senior devotee mentioning about emotional needs one can fulfill in grihasta brahmacharya ashram he mentioned what is emotion where is emotion mentioned in shastras that a new trend has come up have attachment have attachment to hearing Krishna Kata. There's nothing like emotional needs. That's in the mind. I felt really like, am I stone? So I was able to relate to your lecture today. How? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So that, I mean, that's my point of giving this lecture. That's a common understanding. Like, where's emotion mentioned in Shastra? Like every page. 
offer me with devotion, you know, the six loving exchanges, like what? This devotee is trying not to feel. If you don't feel, how can you feel love for Krishna? Love for Krishna begins by loving others. So Gopina says, I think it's important to know how we feel even if we don't want to share them. That's my learning at least, yeah. That's a very good answer. Okay, we'll end class here. I hope you feel it's okay to end. How do you feel about that, ending class now? No, don't end. Now we're going to go chant Japa. How do you feel about that? Oh, Japa, oh no. How do I feel about